Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this 2014 University of, of Edinburgh Gifford Lecture. My name is uh, Jo Shaw. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm a member of the Gifford Committee. Uh, the Gifford Lectures, as some of you uh, I'm sure already know, but I'll tell you anyway. The Gifford Lectures were established in 1887 under the will of Adam Lord Gifford, a senator of the College of Justice. Lord Gifford's intention was to promote and diffuse the study of natural theology in the widest sense of the term. They're held at each of the four ancient Scottish universities, and these world-renowned lectures have brought distinguished international scholars from diverse intellectual disciplines to Scotland to contribute to the advancement of theological and philosophical thought. This evening, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Justice Catherine O'Regan, hereinafter referred to as Kate, <laughs> to Edinburgh to give her Gifford lecture entitled, What is Caesar's? Adjudicating Faith in Modern Constitutional Democracies. Uh, just a, a very brief biography. Kate O'Regan was born in Liverpool and was raised in Cape Town. And she uh, took her degrees in, uh, in Cape Town, in Sydney, and also at the London School of Economics. Her work in the law has included practicing as an attorney in Johannesburg, specializing in labor law and land rights law, where she acted for a wide range of trade, union in, trade unions, anti-apartheid organizations, and several communities under threat of eviction under apartheid land policy. Uh, she, she's also worked as an academic. She joined the University of Cape Town in 1988 and uh, was a founder member of both the Law, Race and Gender Research Project and the Institute for Development Law at UCT. She was an advisor to the African National Congress on land claims legislation. In 1994, aged just 37, she was appointed by President Nelson Mandela as a judge to the newly formed South African Constitutional Court, where she served the maximum term of 15 years. Since then, she's also held a number of very important appointments as the inaugural chairperson of the United Nations Internal Justice Council. She's an acting judge of the Supreme Court of Namibia. She's uh, a, a member of many editorial boards, and she's been closely involved with the establishment of the South African Legal Information Institute since 2005, which provides free access to judgments of courts across Southern Africa. She also serves on the boards of several non-governmental organizations in the field of human rights, constitutionalism, and the rule of law. This stellar career, of course, has been recognized in a number of ways with honorary doctorates, and she's an honorary professor at the University of Cape Town, a visiting professor at the University of Oxford, and in 2012, she spent several months as a housing vis Hauser visiting, global visiting professor at New York University. I need to tell you briefly that the lecture this evening is being recorded and the video will shortly be available online on the Gifford website. I now have great pleasure in handing you over to Justice Catherine O'Regan. Thank you very much indeed for that warm welcome and indeed for the sunny welcome. It's my third trip to Edinburgh, and it's really the first time I've seen a blue sky in Edinburgh, so I feel it's most, most auspicious. It's also a great honor and privilege to be delivering um, the, the Gifford Lecture in 2014. Adam Lord Gifford and I share, of course, a career. We're both judges, and it seems quite appropriate then to spend the next little while talking about the adjudication of faith in modern constitutional democracies. Context is very important in law. And so before I start, I think it's important to say that I approach the topic of adjudication of faith very much uh, with my background as a judge in the South African Constitutional Court in mind. The South African Constitutional Court was appointed in 1994 to adjudicate a constitution which was developed in the 1990s. And that constitution learned an enormous amount from the jurisprudence and from the uh, texts of constitutional documents and Bill of Rights documents around the world. One of the interesting clauses of the South African Constitution 
re requires judges, when they're interpreting rights in the Bill of Rights, to look at international law and says that judges may look at the jurisprudence of other open democracies. So a debate that is, much time is spent on in the United States was put right beyond um, uh, the, the issue in South Africa, and it meant that all the way through our adjudication, we spent time looking at what, the, uh, what other open democracies did in relation to the rights we were adjudicating. And nowhere, may I say, is that more difficult than in the area of faith. So when I was first approached to give this lecture, I was delighted to be able to spend a bit more time thinking about this topic. Um, and that's, it's, it's in that context, then, that I'm going to talk about it today. The first thing to note is that worldwide, religion is part of the human population's lives. According to the Pew Research Center, 84% of the world's population claim a religious affiliation. 2.2 billion of them are Christian, 1.6 billion are Muslim, 1 billion are Hindu, half a billion Buddhist, and 1.1 billion claim no religious affiliation at all. So in an, in, in an interconnected world, the issue of the relationship between faiths and between different faiths is going to increase as we go forward. More and more countries are religiously diverse. And it's not surprising then that one of the most important principles in the human rights arena is the concept of freedom of religion. It's always useful to start with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes the right to change his religion or belief and freedom, either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching practice, worship, and observance. So this is the founding text of freedom of religion. And it's very interesting how that text it has persisted with very little change through a whole range of documents. Nearly every other human rights instrument adopts similar language. So the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 18.1, is almost absolutely identical. But interestingly, for the first time, Article 18.3 of the International Covenant introduces the idea of limiting the right of freedom of religion. It states that freedom to manifest one's religions or beliefs may be subject to only such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health or morals, or the fundamental freedoms of others. If you then look at regional charters, such, such as the African Charter of Human and People's Rights, Article 8 protects freedom of religion and belief. Article 9.1 of the European Convention on Human Rights does so as well. And in my own jurisdiction, sections 15 and 31 of the South African Constitution protect it. And the protection of freedom of religion has given rise to a rich jurisprudence around the world with some really difficult questions. And I've just selected four of the relatively recent cases. Should a Sikh believer be required to produce an identification photograph taken without his turban? Should a complainant in a sexual offence case be permitted to testify while wearing a niqab or a veil covering her face, save for her eyes? Should parents be able to require that the content of school syllabuses be consistent with their religious beliefs? And may the state prohibit the wearing of religious clothing in schools? The answers to these questions have sometimes been contradictory. So for example, in relation to the first question, the question as to whether a, a Sikh should be required to remove his turban in order to have an identity photograph taken bareheaded, the European Court of Human Rights held that this was not a breach of Article 9 of the European Convention. And in fact, in a, an admissibility case, they didn't even think it was worth to, to hear the full argument. And yet, on exactly the same facts, the United Nations Human Rights Commi Committee held that compelling a Sikh to remove his turban for his identification photograph was unnecessary and disproportionate. This, I might add, in relation to both the same country, France, the same issue, and a text which, between the International Covenant and the European Convention, varies very little. In addition to that sort of contradiction, there's clear disagreement across jurisdictions. 
So in France, the wearing of religious apparel in schools has been prohibited since 2004. Yet in Canada in 2006, the Supreme Court held that a Sikh believer must be given exemption from a school rule to be able to wear his traditional kirpan or dagger, although on the basis that it would be sewn into his garments and not visible. Again, the issues of freedom of religion often divide appellate courts. I've selected again a recent case, which I mentioned in my list of cases, the Canadian niqab case. In that case, a Muslim woman who wore the niqab, which covers her face, laid criminal charges against her uncle for sexual abuse when she was a child. And she requested permission to testify while wearing the niqab. The Su Supreme Court of Canada split three ways on this issue. The majority referred the matter back to the trial court and said the trial court needed to answer four questions in deciding whether the woman should be permitted to testify while wearing a niqab. Would requiring the witness to remove her niqab interfere with her religious freedom? Would permitting her to testify while wearing a niqab put the fairness of trial at risk? And if both religious freedom and the fair trial were engaged, fair trial right were engaged, was there some way to accommodate both? And if not, would requiring the witness to remove the niqab outweigh the harmful consequences for permitting her to testify wearing a niqab? I can only imagine the trial court's response, which after months of consideration, so thanks very much, Supreme Court. You've really made it very easy for us to answer this question. One, one of the dissenting judgments held that a rule should be established as the established that witnesses may not testify if their faces were obscured at all. In other words, a simple, clear rule. Obscured face, no witness. The other one said that a witness who establishes that a, as a result of her sincerely held religious belief, she wears a niqab, she should always be permitted to testify. You can see the jurisprudential approach on, on two sides. We had clear rules, and in the middle we had the approach of the majority. Not an easy case. Sometimes judicial decisions are rejected by legislatures. Famously, in 1990, the United States Supreme Court ruled that believers were not entitled to be exempted from generally applicable rules of law as long as those rules of law pursued legitimate government objectives. No exemption for religious belief. But in 1993, the United States legislature enacted legislation called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, providing that government shall not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion. When that issue, that, that legislation came before the US Supreme Court in 1997, the Supreme Court held that it could only apply in relation to federal government. But nevertheless, several states have enacted religious protection laws. Perhaps it's not surprising that we see so much disagreement and contradiction in the area. These are very hard cases in very contested environments. But the question that really it brings to mind is, what does this level of contestation, contradiction, and disagreement mean for the project of human rights adjudication at all? We will all remember Jeremy Bentham's famous comment about natural rights, that they were nonsense upon stilts. But cont and contemporary philosophers and lawyers remain skeptical about the project of human rights, and particularly about the adjudication of human rights. Jonathan Sumption, for example, one of the judges of the um, UK Supreme Court, has on several occasions in public expressed skepticism about the value of the adjudication of rights and the importance of leaving some of these questions to legislatures. Skeptics particularly like to point to the indeterminacy of rights adjudication, the fact that we cannot be sure as to what the outcome is, and the illegitimacy of judges to make decisions where results are indeterminate. Freedom of religion is one of the most difficult rights and one that produces contradictory outcomes, even when textual provisions are similar. So it's perhaps one of the strongest cases for human rights skepticism. Does it mean that we should abandon the protection of freedom of religion, especially the protection of freedom of religion through adjudication? That's the question I'm going to explore in the rest of my remarks this evening. And to answer it, I shall firstly look more closely at our global context. Then I shall look at the philosophical and political roots of the protection of freedom of religion. And finally, at the ways in which courts have adjudicated the right to freedom of belief around the world. 
and then I shall attempt a cautious answer. We live in a time of religious turmoil and extremism, both in the West and the East. Doctrines of religious extremism generally assert one or more of the following propositions. That there is only one true religion. That a particular interpretation of that religion is the only correct interpretation. And that the state should act in accordance with the belief that there is only one true religion and the correct interpretation of it. And I was reminded on the weekend by the Sudan apostasy case that a fourth principle is often to be found in religious extremism, which is you may not leave your religion. These principles of fundamentalist religions are completely at odds with our protection of freedom of religion. But we need to recognize that freedom of religion is not purely a construct of Western philosophy and political tra tradition. It has its roots far wider Akbar, the 16th century Mughal Muslim emperor in India, codified minority rights, which include freedom of religion, a fact that Amartya Sen has referred to both in his theory of his justice and in his book on identity and culture. If one reads William Dalrymple's fascinating account from the Holy Mountain, A Journey in the Shadow of Byzantium, he describes the traditional relationship between Muslim and Christian communities in the Levant over hundreds of years, which are finally break, breaking down in the late 20th and early 21st century. But the, those relationships were based fundamentally on, on shared expectations of tolerance and acceptance of other patterns of religious belief. In Cape Town, Dalrymple's book has very strong echoes in the community that has historically been called the colored community, descended in part from Muslim slaves from Java and Indonesia transported to the Cape in the 17th and 18th century by the Dutch East India Company as slaves, as well as the Khoi Khoi indigenous people and Dutch settlers. So they have this complicated um, background. But it is a community that is deeply both Muslim and Christian, with churches and mosques in every neighborhood. Recently, when I was invited to mediate a complicated issue arising in this community, drawing on both Christian and Muslim um, organizations, I asked them in the opening sessions of the mediation, well, what are the ground rules here? And the very first ground rule that was put to me and completely agreed with was we are going to respect one another's religions and we are not going to do anything which will be seen in, by the other religion as threatening or harmful to that religion. It was an absolute basic ground rule. If you travel through those communities, you will see that um, the difference, the, there is almost no difference in terms of areas and um, appearance of people who are Muslim and Christian. They've lived side by side for hundreds of years, and deep patterns of tolerance. Uh, similarly, in South Africa, the African principle of Ubuntu is a principle that is based on recognizing the humanity of others and recognizing that, in fact, we are human beings simply in our humanity rests in our recognition of the humanity of others. I am a human being through other human beings. These are principles that are deeply uh, supportive of a tolerant understanding of religion, religious difference. But of course, the ideas of the Reformation in particular were very important in the formulation of freedom of religion. And John Locke's letter concerning toleration has been cited by courts around the world when they interpret freedom of religion. His argument was really that political power is aimed at the protection of civil interests, what he referred to as the bona civilia life, liberty, health, and property. And that judges using temporal reasons could not resolve disputes based on religious disagreement. So he argued that the state should be separated from religious institutions and a diversity of be belief should be protected but only, and only restricted if the, states, if the states need to address the bona cavilia required it. So that very simple structure of tolerance, recognition of a range of practices, limitation only in circumstances where it was necessary. Underlying his assertion of freedom of religion, however, is a second order principle, which needs acceptance. And that is that the state should tolerate all forms of religious belief. Religious extremists who assert that the state must give effect to the principles of the one true religion cannot accept the second order principle. But there wasn't only Locke's approach to religion, there was also Thomas Hobbes. In Leviathan, he argues somewhat differently to Locke as to how we should approach religious difference. 
He understood the primary role of the state being to avoid chaos and anarchy. And his view was that it was the private judgment of individuals that led to conflict. So the state needed to act to prevent individuals from exercising their private judgment in a manner that would threaten the public purpose of the state. And the primary public purpose was the maintenance of peace. Because religion was a driver of conflict in his view, he argued that the state must assert authority over the interpretation of religion to ensure religious belief does not threaten public purposes. So the key difference between Locke and Hobbes relates to the different roles that they attribute to the state. Locke urges the state not to interfere with religion, save in circumstances where it's necessary to do so. But Hobbes asserts that religion, if left to its own devices, will undermine public peace and argues that the state should regulate religion in order to achieve its purposes. It's interesting that the contestation between Locke and Hobbes survives in contemporary disagreement about how we should protect religion. Many jurisdictions adopt an approach to freedom of religion that protects the manifestation of belief, save where it's necessary in the public interest to limit that freedom, the Lockean approach. Yet there are examples of a Hobbesian approach that accept that the state should interfere directly in religion in order to pr promote the state's own values and purposes. So turning then to look at freedom of religion and its adjudication. It's important to realize that there actually are two important aspects to freedom of religion, one of which is often not actually mentioned in religious clauses. And that one is that the relationship between the state and religious institutions. What is the relationship between the state and religious institutions and what is the role of the state in relation to them? And the second one is how far do we protect the manifestation of belief? which also includes a prohibition on discrimination on grounds of religious affiliation. The two are captured pithily in the First Amendment to the United States Constitu Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof. So now let's turn to this first question, the role of the state. It's not expressly mentioned in the UDHR, in the International Covenant, or in the regional human rights instruments, or in most domestic bills of rights. Yet I would argue that understanding the relationship between state and religion is central to our understanding of freedom of religion. There are, of course, a range of possible models. Political atheism adopted by the communist states. There is theocracy. But most importantly for our purposes, there are states respecting freedom of religion, either with an established church or with an, a commitment to religious neutrality. All of these models impact on how freedom of religion is adjudicated. The religious neutrality is certainly from um, a, an adjudication point of view, one of the most common, though not the case, of course, in the United Kingdom. Um, in the USA and, and in Australia, there's a strong non-establishment clause with a free exercise clause. I've just read it out to you. The state shall not establish a religion but it will permit free exercise of religion. So that's one model. Secondly, there's the expressly secular state, very much come to prominence in the last 10 years with the, the French principle of laïcité and the Turkish principle of laïc, but it's also to be found in the Indian constitution, in the, in the preamble to the Indian constitution, a state that will be expressly secular. And then thirdly, the model into which I think South Africa falls, as does Canada, it's neither an expressly secular state, nor a state that is a firmly non-establishment state, but it's a state which says, we acknowledge the diversity of religions, we tolerate and or celebrate the diversity of religions, and we, don't, um, we will have no firm rules about being secular. If one looks at the non-establishment clause, you can see that there is a tension at times, particularly in the US jurisprudence, between the non-establishment clause and the free exercise clause. That's the principle that the state will not regulate religion on the one hand, or be involved at all in religion on the one hand, and the principle that people should be freely entitled to exercise their religion. I mentioned earlier the case in which the US Supreme Court held that no believer may be exempted from general laws. This was a decision of the US Supreme Court in 1990, overturned by, the, um, by Congress in 1993. But in it, Justice Scalia reasoned that allowing an exemption 
for a generally applicable legitimate law would be courting anarchy, a danger that increases, he said, in direct proportion to the society's diversity of religious belief and its determination to coerce or suppress none of them. Very strong statements. Um, it then led to the Religious Freedom of Restoration Act in 1993 and then on in 1997 to the Supreme Court ruling saying that the new legislation applied only in, federal, in, the, in relation to the federal government. There is a judgment, a case pending before the US Supreme Court argued in March um, where these issues uh, arise firmly for decision. Hobby Lobby Stores, Inc. Um, involves a company whose shareholders are Mennonite Christians who dispute the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, which requires all employers to include provision for all FDA, Federal, uh, federal Drugs Administration approved contraceptives in their health care insurance plans. So the Affordable Care Act does include an exemption for religious institutions and religiously affiliated nonprofits, but not for profit making companies. The company asserts that the ACA provisions infringe its right to religious freedom as protected by the federal legislation. So wound up in this question is the question of whether a, a for-profit company can be said to have a religious belief which it's entitled to protect and whether it's entitled to protect it in a manner which means that it does not have to apply with the Affordable Care Act to um, pro provide contraceptives in their health care insurance plans. So this question is whether it's going to be whether Hobby Lobby stores religious belief has been unduly burdened by the federal legislation. In France, we have similar, uh, or not similar issues, but equally complex issues arising. The principle of laïcité in the French Republic is understood to have roots going back to Henri IV's Edict of Nantes, the famous edict which allowed Huguenots to practice their uh, Protestant religion. The 1995 law that introduced laïcité asserted that the Republic, sorry, 1905 law, asserted that the Republic does not recognize, endorse, or subsidize any religion, a clear statement of secular purpose. And all religions that do not advocate violence are accepted, but the state must be secular and may not discriminate in favor of any religion or against it. So the case, the, the, or the issue really rose to prominence in the late 1980s and early 1990s around the headscarf debate. Two girls were expelled from a school in Noirs for wearing the headscarf. Vigorous public debate uh, led to President Chirac establishing a commission, the Stasi Commission, uh, in, 2000 and, uh, in, in 1990, or, or sorry, in 2003, to, to investigate what should happen about headscarves. And in 2004, Parliament adopted, the French Parliament had adopted a law which provided, amongst other things, that ostentatious religious symbols were banned in French schools, <coughs> and the headscarf was considered to be an ostentatious religious symbol. The main argument was that, the, that Parliament gave in favour of this was that the purpose was to remove religion from schools so that they may provide a peaceful clima, climate, a climat de serenité, in a school environment. The, the issue has gone further, of course, in relation to face covering. In April 2011, a law came into effect in France prohibiting the covering of the face in public spaces. The prohibish, prohibition includes masks, helmets, and the niqab, but does not include headscarves. So it's the niqab which covers your face but leaves your eyes um, uh, to be you know, visible that is prohibited. In November 2013, a challenge was brought by SAS, a young Muslim woman who wears a niqab in public as a manifestation of her religious belief before the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. In that case, the French government argued that the ban was a general one and that it was important for citizens to be identifiable when required in the public sphere. So you can see a different argument to the headscarf in schools case. Here it was a case of the need to identify um, people in the public sphere. The decision on that is still pending, like the Hobby Lobby case. This is a pending case before the European Court of Human Rights. Turning then to South Africa. South Africa is a, a religious society, but a non, not committed to secularism and not committed to non-establishment. Approximately 80% of South Africans consider themselves to be Christians. And there are significant minorities of other religions, particularly African indigenous religions, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. Our history, of course, is important in this respect. The apartheid state defined itself as a Christian national state with laws governing Sunday observance and a national school syllabus devoted to Christian national education. 
Many Christian denominations, particularly the Dutch Reformed Church, had separate church churches for believers of different racial groups. So in responding to this history, the South African Constitution does not adopt a strictly secular state approach, nor does it contain a non-establishment clause. But it protects freedom of religion and belief and prohibits unfair discrimination on the grounds of religion, conscience, and belief. It permits religious observances in state institutions, providing that the observances follow rules made by appropriate public authorities. They are conducted equitably and attendance at them is voluntary. In practice, at formal occasions, such as the inauguration of the president and the opening of parliament, you find that representatives from different religious groups are present and offer prayers. So it is common that Christian pastors or priests, Muslim imams, Jewish rabbis, and Hindu priests will participate in such ceremonies. And there have been no major controversies around religious issues in, this, in the public sphere. So that's really summed up sort of three different state approaches to the relationship between the state and religion. You have the non-establishment approach that you found in the United States, the laicite approach that you find in France and, of course, in Turkey, and I've mentioned India, and finally the non-secular and non-establishment approach where the focus is on recognizing and accepting religious difference that you find in the South African Constitution and very similarly in, similar in the Canadian Constitution. I want to turn now then to the second aspect of religious freedom, the right to practice, which of course is the issue that comes up before courts all the time. So the approach differs markedly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, even though one tends to find that the text doesn't. And I would assert that the constitutional model for the relationship between the state and religious institutions, the first aspect that I've just discussed, and in particular the implications uh, of that question and for determining whether state action that limits religion is justifiable is a key determinant of how courts approach this second aspect. Other important issues, of course, are different historical and political contexts, different dominant religions, and the role that institutionalized religion has played in a, in a society, as well as the political history of, of that country. By and large, a, most jurisdictions ask the same two questions. Has there been an interference with freedom of religion? And if there has, is the infringement justifiable? There are different approaches to the first question, and India is a very interesting case in point. Sometimes, as I say, the difference lies in how you focus the first question. In India, the courts have held that it is only essential practices of religion that are protected under freedom of the religion. And the courts have held that essential practices do not include, quote, superstitious beliefs and practices that may be extraneous and unessential accretions to the religion itself. So they actually look, and of course, the vast majority of cases, not all of them, but the vast majority of cases before the Indian Supreme Court have involved Hinduism. And the judges have been willing to look closely at the practice of Hinduism and say, oh, this isn't actually part of Hinduism, but this is. And it's been argued uh, by... Pratap Banamehta, one of India's leading commentators on constitutional issues, that this essential practices test has given the courts a wide authority to determine, interpret, and regulate the meaning of religion. He argues that it has enabled courts to minimize the conflict between free exercise of religion and the secular purpose of the state by constructing an argument that, in effect, the practices being an issue were not essential to that religion. This, he observes, is Hobbesian in flavor. The courts are seeking to ensure that the religious practices are not in conflict with the state's public goals by saying this religious practice isn't actually a real religious practice at all. It's not actually essential to the belief, so therefore we don't have to protect it, and therefore we don't have to ask the question whether in fact it's in conflict with the state's purposes. In France, the... Most of the differences actually relate to, um, it, it relate to this question of what constitutes religion. In France, as I've discussed above, the French principle of laicite has been understand, uh, understood to authorize limitations on freedom of religion by the French parliament. The first one is the one I spoke about a minute ago. In 2004, um, the French government prohibited the ostentatious display of religious symbols in schools, effectively outlawing the headscarf and the turban and in 2011 prohibited any person from covering their face in a public space. The public purposes pursued by these laws were different, but founded nevertheless on the principle of laicite. 
In Canada and South Africa, you find a different approach again. And I think this is because there is no strong sense of, of the desirability of secularism. The Canadian Supreme Court and the South African Constitutional Court accept that there are circumstances in which believers may demand an exemption from general laws. Generally, courts in both countries have worked with an approach which recognizes the importance of belief to human beings and seeks to ensure that believers can manifest their belief unless the state can show that the limitation of the right is justifiable and that affording an exemption would undermine the state's purposes in some serious way. Europe, again, is a different story. And that's partly, of course, because it's a supranational court. So it's regulating under one provision, um, freedom of religion, a range of states, all of whom, or many of whom, have different practices. So that you will have a st states where there's an established church, states where there's not established church, states where the, um, the, relationship, the historical relationship between the religion and politics has been very strong. And this has made it a particularly difficult jurisdiction, I think. It has accordingly given a very significant margin of appreciation to member states in this area. It is more willing to accept that a state doc doctrine of laicite, or in the Turkish case, laic, is of sufficient importance to permit a limitation of the right. For example, the Sikh ID photograph case I mentioned right at the outset, where the European Court of Human Rights was quite sure that it was perfectly acceptable to say to a, a Sikh person, man, that you m must take off your turban for identification. Although the UN Human Rights Committee said that's, there's no real purpose here that's sufficient to outweigh, the, um, to, to outweigh the freedom of religion. There is, however, a sense that there may be some change in the air. The recent British Airways crucifix case, Aweda versus United Kingdom, in which the court held that it was a, a breach of a person's, or limitation, unjustifiable limitation of a person's freedom of religion, an air uh, steward on British Airways, to wear a cross over her uniform. Um, was a change from the way in which the European Court had talked about these things before. Yet the pending SAS case, which I've spoken about, the case about um, no covering of your face in public, is a hard test for the court, particularly in the light of another recent judgment in the crucifix in the Italian classroom case, where the court held that where a crucifix in a classroom, in a public school classroom, is not actually favoring one religion over another, if one looked across the broad experience of, um, of Europe. And there was a strong dissent in the Lazi case, but um, nevertheless, the, the judgment ruled that the crucifix in the classroom was accepted. And one of the reasons I think that Europe is so hard is because if it's key to the question how we deal with um, granting exemptions for religious belief, if it's key to that question, what the relationship between the state and the church is, the fact that there's so many different models in Europe make it particularly difficult. In my view, one of the most troubling areas is schools. And it's remarkable how many of these cases do arise in schools. Lao Tse, the, the crucifix case I've spoken about, um, there, there are strings of cases in most jurisdictions on schools. The reason the French government gave for its rule prohibiting religious apparel in schools is that it is a choice to protect the integrity of the child against the real or supposed religious rights and interests of their parents. Similar considerations were raised by Lady Hale in her concurring judgment in the Bogum case, an English case uh, here, where she asserted that the decision to wear a particular form of dress must be the choice of the woman herself. Underpinning both of these considerations is the idea that children may become pawns in a debate, in a, a debate between parents and schools, and that what one really wants to try and do is ensure that children at schools are able to make their own decisions, make up their own mind about religion. A related question involves the question of school syllabuses. Again, an enormous amount of adjudication on school syllabuses. Is it legitimate for the state to insist on children's exposure to diversity in the classroom to foster tolerance? This was an issue that arose in Canada. The Supreme Court considered a challenge to a school board that had decided not to purchase certain prescribed books that depicted families where the parents were of the same sex. Amongst the reasons given for the deci decision, were that it would expose young children of heterosexual families to cognitive dissonance. Chief Justice McLaughlin reasoned that there were many different types of family in Canada and accepted that encountering different types of family might cause cognitive dissonance to school children. But she said dissonance is neither noxious nor, avoid nor avoidable, simply part of living in a diverse society. Exposure to some cognitive dissonance is arguably necessary if children are going to learn about tolerance at all. 
So this slightly Hobbesian flavoured argument suggests that diverse societies need shared values. And if the second order principle which underlies the protection of freedom religion is an acceptance of religious diversity, without a general commitment to that general principle, the prospect of a tolerant and diverse society will be dim. So the question as to whether we can give weight to the state goals, especially in the in education sector, which will promote a commitment to that second order principle, is one of the most interesting questions in this area, in my view. To conclude then, the content of the right to freedom of religion will remain uncertain. Given high levels of religious affiliation, adjudication of freedom of religion will continue to flourish and will be important to believers. It will continue also to be a matter of context and contingency, and there will be considerable disagreement that produces inconsistencies and even contradictions. Most especially, we need to understand that the protection of religious freedom depends on the understanding of the role of the state and its relationship to religious belief. The greatest divergence in relation to the adjudication of belief in modern democracies tends to arise in deciding when the state may legitimately interfere with religious practice in order to pursue the purposes of the state, the what is Caesar's question. Assertively secular states, such as France and Turkey, have asserted the right to prohibit wearing religious garb in public schools and other places. Jurisdictions with other understandings of the relationship may give the state's purposes less weight. But despite inconsistency and contradiction, I would modestly assert that freedom of religion is a project we should defend. It's a, one of the reasons for this is that I think it's important that these issues be debated in a serious and considered way in the public domain. The process of adjudication of religious belief is a, is a human practice that is addressing some of the most complex issues of our societies and a practice that will benefit from discussion and analysis and a continual striving for principled outcomes. The process of litigation is public and open and ensures that debate about the complex issues is aired. The adjudication of Kate, I think, will be at its best if at its heart lies a recognition of the importance of belief for human beings and communities. And that in protecting freedom of religion, we strive to ensure that belief is respected by the state and the importance for the belief of individuals is duly considered when rules are made by the state and other powerful actors. So that is largely a Lockean approach. But finally, I would suggest, in a, with a slightly Hobbesian flavor, that we should not overlook the importance of the centripetal state that seeks to celebrate diversity and understanding so that tolerance and mutual respect may flourish. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening and thank you very much for uh, a most interesting uh, talk. Um, my name is David Lord. I'm uh, a member of the National Secular Society uh, of the UK, but also secretary of the Edinburgh Secular Society. Um, uh, it's been suggested that Scotland needs a constitution, mm. um, and this would be especially so if it went independent, and maybe even necessary if it doesn't go independent. Um, so uh, there was a discussion two weeks ago between Professor Mona Siddiqui, I'm sure you uh, know her at Edinburgh University, and uh, cabinet, Scottish Cabinet Secretary uh, Mike Russell. He's a Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. The dis debate was about whether um, Christianity should uh, appear in a Scottish constitution. Um, and Mike Russell, who is um, a, a, he, um, claims himself to be an evangelical um, uh, Presbyterian, um, he said, most definitely Christian, uh, Christian uh, or Christianity should be in any Scottish constitution. He would expect that to be so. Can I put you on the spot and ask you, um, if you were sitting on a Scottish uh, constitution um, committee, um, what would you be advising uh, the likes of uh, Mike Russell and others? Um, would it be a secular constitution? Would it be a Christian constitution? Would it be a religious constitution? Well, thank you for that. Um, 
And I'm going to sidestep because, of course, this, this issue arose sharply during the South African constitutional negotiations. As I've mentioned, we are, we are a very Christian country, 80%. I'd be interested to know if Scotland can, uh, can outdo that. Probably not. Um, no, I see lots of people shaking their heads. Um, <laughs> yes, well, yes. Um, but, but anyway, so we, we had exactly the same debate. And um, there was quite early on a, a recognition that we did not want an establishment and we didn't want secularism in a firm view. And in fact, it was finally resolved. There were, there were people who very firmly wanted uh, some mention of Christianity or religion. And it was resolved in, in you know, one, one of the examples of the sort of the process producing a good outcome was in the preamble to the South African Constitution, the very final words are in Corsi Sikileli Africa, which are the words of our national anthem, which means God bless Africa. And they're there in three of the South African languages. So that is the only reference to religion in the constitution. And it can be interpreted by those who see it just as an affirmation of our national identity, because it is the language of our, or the opening words, or anyway, they're, they're very important words in our, in our um, national anthem. Um, but also for some people it, it was an, you know, an affirmation of sort of in God we trust, the kind of thing one finds in, in other constitutions. I, I, why do I think that was a good outcome? Because I do think that you complicate um, adjudication, you complicate identity, national identity, if you have exclusive aspects of your constitution that look like they exclude people. And we, we're very conscious of that in South Africa because we have come from such an evil exclusionary past that the need to be inclusive and embracing is an important theme of the South African constitutional text and, and the jurisprudence. And so that, uh, for certainly from a South African perspective, I think this was a very clever outcome. And, and I think it, it captures a, a, a sort of institutional, cultural uh, flavor of the, of the way in which the South African constitution works very well. So I can't answer the this, this Scottish one, but I think I've made it clear that generally I think that you, you, you walk into some quite acute difficulties when you walk very firmly secular or very firmly establishment. Uh, this, uh, maybe that was My name's Anne, and I am a teacher, but I'm afraid I didn't, I did attend the same uh, debate as David did. I didn't hear Mike Russell say that, David, and I hesitate as a teacher to defend Mike Russell. What I think he referred to is the fact that our heritage, our Christian heritage, would possibly be referred to in the preamble of any constitution. But he did expressly say that the constitution would go out for discussion, debate, and it would be the people of Scotland that decided. Uh, I just uh, wanted to clarify that point, if I might, and also to say thank you for a very illuminating lecture. Okay. Yes, uh, back there. You can ask questions from this side. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Sorfer, and I was a very weak law student at the University of Cape Town in the late 80s. I'm no longer a lawyer, if I ever was one. But my question is really about uh, a problem of display, about religious display, um, because this seems to be, at, the, at some base, this seems to be the issue, is that something about displaying religion in public or in, pri well, perhaps even in private. Presumably whatever you think is fine as long as you don't display it. But is that because this is, there's a fear that religious display is linked onto political will, if you like? And I suppose my question is whether in fact you think there should be a specific concern about political display in the way that there is about religious display. Um, and I wonder whether you have any thoughts on that? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, but no, I, I, I think, I, I believe that polit political display is part of the process of a democracy. I think that we can all bring to it our skepticism, our disagreement, our you know, enthusiastic support, whatever we like, but that is, that is part of the way. And, and starting to close down on the possibilities of political display uh, it, it takes you into very murky waters, frankly, when you've taken your first step. 
because um, you know it's difficult to decide what is appropriate and not appropriate. So the sort of harm principle obviously must apply. You can't use political display to harm people in any physical way. But beyond that, I do think political display, which which I sort of understand as speech, basically in in perhaps uh, in performance rather than in actual words, um, is is something we should protect. Religious display, I also generally think we should dis protect. I mean, my understanding of why do we value um, sort of religious belief is that it's a very important expression of your, your humanity to, to many, many people. It forms who they are, determines their life, um, life trajectory in very real ways. And I can't see why we should say, no, you may not wear a crucifix or you may not wear a scarf or you may not wear a turban, which is not going to be any harm to any of the rest of us when it is part of your of this expression of your very fundamental uh, understanding of life, your, your, your kind of life's definitional decisions. So I, I think, um, although I, as I say, my, my one area where I find it more difficult is in the context of public schools, um, because I think that, you know, the, the idea of creating a space for children to grow and to make up their own mind is, um, is, imp is, is our important spaces. But uh, generally, so I, I'm generally pretty tolerant of religious display and completely and committed to the idea of political display, even though I disagree with lots of it. Um, you started with a sort of celebration almost of the fact that the South African Constitution um, gives you a, a leeway to appeal to foreign sources. But in some sense, this is what your lecture was really suggesting towards the end was that maybe not a lot of um, read across from, from foreign sources could be helpful because it was quite dependent on the context of the different countries. And I just sort of was wanted to ask you to reflect a bit more on that. Does that mean that um, essentially you read these other judgments and you, I mean, what are you really doing with them if ultimately the conclusion and your great sympathy with the European Court of Human Rights being that it, ha it has to deal with different contexts. Mm. So I just wondered where that left you on the foreign sources, given that it is a much more heated debate in other countries. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question. And one of the really interesting things about this is this is an area where text varies very little. You know, equality is an area, for example, where text varies enormously in the flavor of text is very, very different. So it's not perhaps so surprising that there's a large amount of difference in application of equality. Here, text varies often, you know, there's a comma or two that are out of place. So it is interesting, and I think, as I try to explain, that I think the reason for the difference does lie on your understanding of the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis religion. You have to start and understand that, which is why the question about what Scotland should do in its constitution is important, because it's gonna have an impact on how you address the second question. My own view about comparative, the, the, the value of comparative uh, work, reading judgments from other jurisdictions, is not so much to say, you know, there were seven this way and four that way and we'll go with the seven or whatever, but actually to continually make you think about what on earth you're doing and what the issues are, where are the traps here? Because the more you read from all different places, just, it, so in, in an, to me in that sense, it's an area which has been the most valuable to make you think about religion, but there is very little agreement and um, the jurisdiction that's definitely closest to South Africa in flavor is Canada in its, in, its, in its approach. And that's, again, I think, because it is, it's not a, sec not a secular state in the sense of firmly asserting secularism, and it really represents, it talks to in this idea of celebration of difference. And the areas where they found it difficult, I think South Africa's gonna find it difficult. The Niqab case, which is the case about the um, sexual um, offense, really hard here, you know, I mean, anybody here who's been a defense lawyer and knows you're gonna to have to cross-examine somebody who is only, you're only gonna see their eyes is, is, you know, really a fair trial issue. And yet on the other hand, it's, you know, I can't think of any more important case uh, to be able to, to feel at ease when you're testifying than a case when you're testifying about sexual abuse. So it's a, it's a really tough case. My one thought about it, I've gone off on a complete tangent, but anyway, my one thought about it <laughs> is that, um, one of the things I think we've learned in South Africa being a diverse society is in fact that one reads less of a witness reliably than one thinks. So cultural difference in terms of behavioral patterns and credibility in the person of the witness in the courtroom is much less 
um, reliable than judges uh, of fact tend to think, and that therefore I may be more sympathetic to the idea that actually, you know, wearing the niqab is not that diff difficult, but I know that if I put that to several of my friends who are defence lawyers, they would say it's really impairing the fair trial right. So it's, it's thinking like that, which is the value of, of comparative jurisprudence. It's, there's no doubt that Europe is terribly, very, very different. It would be interesting if the African court gets going on, on, uh, on freedom of religion, how that would play out there, because you know, there's an enormous diversity in Africa in relationships between the state and religion. So we would, we would potentially see the same sort of thing emerging. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. There's one here. Introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Eve, and I'm a student here. I do philosophy. Um, I thought uh, I very much agreed with uh, your mentions of fostering tolerance. Um, the bit I do sort of struggle with is the idea that the state would foster tolerance towards um, religious organisations, uh, and I'll take Catholicism as an example here, who hold things like uh, homophobia as quite central to doctrine or that contraception or abortion are sinful. Um, and I just don't know if things like the cross and people wearing things that might denote an organisation that says that being a homosexual is a sin. I, the only parallel I can think is to wear something such as a BNP badge and then to say, but I don't agree with the bad parts of it. I only agree with the good parts of it. And I just wonder if what you thought about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, it, it, it is a difficult question. Of course, there's no doubt, I think, I mean, the, uh, the Catholicism would be, would be guilty as charged, but, but, but so would very, very large swathes of other religions uh, on, on those particular issues. And I think, um, you know, if we took gender, gender equality and priests and women, um, you know, you'd find many very, probably the large majority of religious organisations would not um, permit women to be officiate in religious ceremonies of various sorts. You know, I think that underlying, and that's actually the deal that underlies the Lockean principle, which is that we'll give you space to be your own, uh, you to determine your own rules. You may not harm other people. People must be able to leave you. We're not going to have executions for apostasy. So people can make up their own decisions and they can make their own, they can have their own internal struggles about what the belief of the religion should be. But we're not going to endorse or, or, um, we're, or uh, oppose it. In a sense, uh, so that's, that's actually the deal that's there. That we, in, what, in terms of the actual practice of the religion, the rules internal to the religion that don't involve who may go to school and um, you know, hospitals and so on, it, it, you can practice as you like, and, but you may leave. Uh, so the individual decision is to leave if you disagree with it. Um, I think that... It, to take any other approach, which is to say that a religious internal practice which is inconsistent with our particular values is to take on those 84% because it, it, people really do have these beliefs and do, and, in the, and the modern state has acknowledged that. So I think it's practically difficult. And I also probably think that principally, so if one's doing a strategy principle analysis, I think it's probably also wrong. Because at the end of the day, the state is not about telling people what is right um, entirely. It is to leave space for freedom for people to make their own decisions. But a gentleman here asked me um, before we began about the issue of, um, of um, mutilation of young boys, was how he formulated it. Um, but the practice of bris in the Jewish religion um, and circumcision and you know, how do we feel about that? And I think that's a very interesting question. I, I, it's never been raised in a court in South Africa, to which I'm aware. Um, but we, I feel quite strongly that female circumcision, one would say that's, you know, unacceptable. So why do we not feel the same about male circumcision? And I think these are, it's really part of that deal at the bottom of, you know, the Lockean deal that we let people regulate their lives if they're not harming others. Um, and we won't endorse it or stop it. But there's got to be a limit there somewhere, and where do you put that limit? I have a colleague in South Africa who's argued very strongly that we should say that churches will not get any funding from the state at all unless they're completely compliant with the Bill of Rights. Um, but that's the sort of formulation that it's got to be funding from the state. But it would still lead people to say women can't be priests. I don't have all the answers.
<laughs> well, I'm going to vacate the stage and ask Professor Dorothy Meal, who's head of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you so much. I want to begin by thanking all of you who've come along this evening. Um, I, I think it's been an exemplary Gifford lecture, and I think the fact that we've had so many people here from so many different backgrounds and different areas is, is testament to that. But really just to thank you once again, Justice O'Regan, for a wonderful uh, Gifford lecture. You've shown through great scholarship uh, and really stimulating discussion just how important these issues are, not only in very technical uh, judicial areas, but actually as it affects all our lives in a number of different, in all the different parts of the world. So thank you so much for that. It's also been an incredibly accessible lecture. So those of us who aren't uh, lawyers by background, I'm sure have found it as interesting as those who, who know much more about the details. So thank you so much. I'd just like to invite you all to join us downstairs for a short reception where there'll be an opportunity to have a little bit more informal discussion with our speaker this evening. But thank you all very much for coming and can you join me in thanking once again, Catherine. Catherine.